The following is a clip from World Class Bullshitter's Good Morning Pop Culture Radio Show, 7.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, every day, here on the channel. So let's start talking about Godzilla, King of the Monsters, because that's the shit people want to talk about. So I'm excited for this movie, and I'm expecting to hear what you guys think, because we've been having a lot of people say, can you cover Godzilla stuff? Can you do this? Can you do that? Sure. I like you guys. So um, the closer we get to this film over on Patreon, we will do some Godzilla commentaries, and you guys should request to join us if you would like. They'll be fun. We'll do one or two here, but we'll do a good chunk of them over there. That way, I don't have to try to do them live, and it's, you know, that's a lot more functional. So Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Full transparency, I enjoyed Godzilla 2014 a lot. I saw it in theaters. I bought the Blu-ray. I've watched it, I don't know, five times since it's been out. I've watched it more than I've watched Logan. More than I've watched Deadpool. Uh, all kinds of stuff. It's not my favorite movie ever. It's not my favorite movie of 2014. Winter Soldier would be. But it's a damn fine film that I'm happy got made. I've always enjoyed Godzilla movies. I've always been interested in... Not just gi not really giant monsters. I've always been interested in Godzilla himself. There's something about the character. Design. I like the idea of this monster just wrecking a city. People running for fear. Like the Blue Oyster Cult song. You know, They scream to God as he looks in on them. It's a good song. And it's, you know, it's got some cool lyrics to it. So... For me, this was an easy sell. I didn't see Shin Godzilla. I don't even know if it had um, an American dub. If it does, I'll give it a watch. Because I, I used to take great pleasure watching the old Japanese Godzilla films where the dubs didn't match. And it's just like, huh, okay. He moved his mouth once, but he just read a paragraph about nuclear fission. Sure, I'll buy it. Where's the monster? But the 2014 Godzilla had a lot of... Um, patience in the way it showed Godzilla. I liked that. And I liked the big payoff, especially when he ripped open the thing's mouth and shot the uh, that fire blast into his mouth. I was like, yeah! Because you wait and you build. Much like Hot Fuzz, much like Star Wars, much like Back to the Future, you build these big payoffs. And you have little twists and turns that think you're going to lose, and then you get right back on the path. That's much how life is at times. And you have your big payoff moments. I don't like movies that are just non-stop, non-stop action in your face. Um, even something like a Die Hard ebbs and flows. So that is your little uh, inside look at my psyche. But on Godzilla King of the Monsters trailer, I thought it looked good. I liked the designs of the monsters. We got to see Mothra. Uh, I think we saw Rodan, King Ghidorah, all kinds of characters. I'm sold on the designs. We're now... We talked about this yesterday with Bumblebee, and I'll bring this up again, but I firmly believe we're now living in an era where we don't want to re-engineer a lot of things to sell the characters. The characters have a built-in audience, built-in fan base, a built-in emotional response to their looks, their designs. And for the most part, the other monsters, not Godzilla, Godzilla looks much different, but I still dig the design. But the other monsters look... Like you imagine them, just updated versions. It's almost like they took what the old Toho suits and uh, CGI them and made them realistic, added textures and this and that. I mean, Ghidorah's going to look awesome when it's not, you know, a thing on strings flying around, puppetry. But you got to respect the old way that the films were made. I'm not here to knock them. Shit, I'd love to go watch them and have a good laugh and have some fun with them. Because we don't have too much fun with these movies. Now, my only complaint slash criticism slash concern is I hope that Millie Bobby Brown isn't the main focus of this movie because I don't really like that kid. Stranger Things is cool and all that's great, but I'm more focused on the monster action, so hopefully it does that well. We got a lot of it. If I have to wait, fine, but I want the other stuff around it, the people's story, to be very interesting. Now, the Senate scene reminds me a lot of Batman vs. Superman, but I do like the concept of testing out monsters. And I really want them to find one of those giant, they call them titans. Finding one of them, thinking they're good, and then just getting wiped out. Like some military base gets wiped out by, well, Mothra's a good guy. Well, female too, I think. 
But it'll be interesting to see that element, that dynamic. And this comes out next, what, let's say March? When does come? Okay, Google. Godzilla, King of the Monsters release date. May 31st, 2019. Okay, so we got plenty of time between Avengers and this movie. So um, I think it's going to be... I think it's going to be a hit. I think we've now come full circle. Like I say all the time, what was old is now new again. Godzilla, King Kong. Uh, they tried it with Universal Monsters, but they did it poorly. If you would have launched the Universal Monsters Dark Universe properly, and in instead of trying to just launch a universe, but actually tell good stories, uh, I think you would have had a successful start because people like horror. We had Halloween reboot slash uh, sequel happen. We've had all kinds of movies hit it big at the box office in terms of horror, in terms of iconic monsters and classic things. And the reason I'm into, you know, Godzilla being out again, or, you know, even though I didn't love Halloween, I'm excited for the idea of seeing Michael Myers, is because a thing like Godzilla doesn't really ruin what came before it, and it doesn't go against what the property is. With Star Wars, sorry, ugh, I hate to say it, they took what was there, they, took, they bastardized it to build up the new characters. Godzilla seems to be the only constant in these movies. Yeah, you have some kids on Earth, or you have some aliens from Planet X, or something like that. But then in the next movie, they're gone, and it's Godzilla again. We're conditioned, that's how it goes. James Bond, new Bond girls. Every once in a while, you get a carryover, like Eunice Gason from Dr. Noda from Russia with Love, or Leah Sado in the new film, uh, Spectre, and she'll be in Bond 25, which sounds better and better every day that I hear about. But the trailer, like I said, it was a win for me. I didn't have to watch it multiple times to go, I'm in. Now, Avengers, I didn't have to watch multiple times to say I'm in, but I had to watch it a couple times you know, on the edge of, you know, no sleep, as well as a good night's rest to just feel something. So if I'm going to compare those trailers, I still say Avengers got me more excited, like I felt something, but I thought the Godzilla trailer, which was an actual trailer, not just a teaser, was a much better produced trailer. Avengers was a teaser, but a long teaser, if you know what I'm saying. And, uh, those are my thoughts, just to compare the two. Much better than the Captain Marvel trailer. Uh, Captain Marvel did show a lot more than Avengers, but at the same time, there was a lot of cringe. Godzilla had no cringe. It was all uh, killer, no filler. So take me to May. I'm there. I'll see that movie opening night. Well, let me rephrase that. We'll have a show that Thursday, and then I'll go see it. Well, you know what? Maybe. You know what we might do? Because summer movie season, the blockbuster season, is too big to pass up. Maybe, if you guys are interested enough, we will make Godzilla one of our exclusive live reviews right after it comes out. So, May 31st, well shit, it'll be May 30th, actually that'll be the Thursday. All the guys will descend upon their local movie theaters, and then we'll get home, and we'll review it live, and we'll have a podcast. And, you know, you guys can get that action from us as soon as possible. So if you'd like that, let me know. And like I said, next, after Avengers comes out, we'll, we'll uh, throw some Godzilla stuff at you. So I guess we should start working on that now. So if you are a patron and you want to join us for Godzilla commentaries, contact us. Right now we're getting ready to do Fantastic Four for somebody. We have to do Mother, and we have to do something else that somebody requested. So we have those three that are in the backlog, as well as some of our Christmas stuff. But uh, you guys know how to contact us. So let me see what you guys are saying about the trailer, if anybody's talking about it. Uh, Godzilla vs. King Kong has me excited. Very excited. I can't wait to see that movie. For example, when I saw Godzilla, or King Kong Skull Island, was it last year? And we and I sat through the theater, waiting, waiting, waiting. Once I heard that Godzilla scream, I was like, oh shit. I got goosebumps. I was ready to go. So even Brie Larson's frowny ass could not keep me from being excited about that. So now, uh, here comes a little bit of a longer segment. So... Uh, let me check the chat one more time. Nothing. Okay. We're going into a deep dive with Godzilla right now. You guys want this kind of stuff. You guys are going to get this kind of stuff. So let me pull up a picture of the original Godzilla so you can see how far the characters come, or Gojira. And we'll start talking about 
There's a band called Gojira. Uh, film. That's weird. So, 1954 Gojira. We'll look at the poster. When I hit it even bigger, I want to do... I want to collect Japanese movie posters. I just love Japanese movie posters. There's something about the way they're laid out. I just can't get enough of them. So, we're going to go from this beautifully rendered new Godzilla uh, poster to this classic Godzilla poster. And there we go. So, God, the original Godzilla movie was a metaphor for the devastating effects of nuclear weapons. When someone mentions Godzilla and its Japanese origins, people often think of the outdated visual effects, a clumsy man in a lizard suit, and a number of over-the-top actors who seem to be trying too hard to convince the audience of the creature's dangers. That stereotype, however, was created by the 1956 American cut of the original Japanese film. The American cut was titled Godzilla, King of the Monsters. For the American version, the producers had removed more than 16 minutes of footage and replaced it with a subplot involving an American journalist witnessing a giant monster's rampage across Tokyo. In addition to the film, uh, the film was poorly dubbed in English, which influenced the reception significantly, as the actors looked silly while being out of sync with the voiceover. But what really downsized the quality of the original motion picture directed by Ishiro Honda was the censorship of the ex explicit subtext, which dealt with the devastating effects of atomic weapons, effects to which the Japanese were introduced to a decade prior to the release of the original film. The original version became a landmark of kaiju Japanese genre featuring giant monsters as main antagonists. Having witnessed the destroyed city of Hiroshima one year after the atomic bomb was dropped, Honda became captivated with the idea of such destructive power in the hands of men. Even though Honda was determined to commemorate the disaster that struck Japan in 1945 and brought World War II to its end, the immediate post-war years made it impossible to address the matter directly. Censorship, endorsement by the American forces occupying Japan, forbade the film directors and artists of other sorts to portray the contemporary topics, and most of all, to be critical of the American military presence. This means that the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were almost too taboo, especially in the period between 1945 and 1952. Concerning the subject of censorship in Japan, Claude Esteby, a visual culture scholar from France, gave a comment for the Bangkok Times in 2012. Japan was occupied by the U.S. Army until September 1952. During this period, there, there was a ban imposed by American forces on information about the Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear bombings and their aftermaths, namely the radioactivity-induced diseases. But since the initial development of nuclear weapons, the Cold War dictated that the research must go further. The second generation of nuclear weapons was already on its way that needed to be tested. In 1954, the U.S. Army conducted the test of its hydrogen bomb in the Pacific Ocean. At the same time, a Japanese fishing boat called Lucky Dragon 5 was caught up by the wave of radiation released from the blast. The crew was poisoned and suffered acute radiation syndrome. The boat's chief radio man, Akechi Kobayama, subsequently died from the poisoning. Luckily, the other crew members managed to recover. Nevertheless, the incident sparked a strong anti-nuclear movement in Japan, especially because after the events, rumors started circulating that contaminated fish had entered the market. In addition to this, the Soviet Union was also testing its own nuclear weapons on the far northeast section of the country. The Japanese were caught between two fires. Under such circumstances, Honda decided to make his own vision come true. He convinced of a giant he conceived of a giant monster awakened from, from the depths of the ocean by the power of the nuclear tests. The monsters itself would have enormous strengths and would breathe fire while leaving radioactive traces of contaminant to the survivors of its rampage. Honda called it Gojira, a mixture of the Japanese word for whale, Kujira, and the English word for gorilla, which was a clear reference to King Kong. Since the occupation was over in 1952, the censorship was losing its power. That didn't mean the authorities weren't worried about Honda's script, but since the film would fall into the science fiction genre, they misjudged its allegorical potential. The result was a truly bleak and disturbing picture. Images of destroyed buildings, homeless people, stretcher-bearing, carrying dead and wounded together with an unstoppable force of nature in the form of a giant lizard invoked memories of the devastation the country had gone through after a war that had begun with Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and included atrocities committed by Japan. In the film, a Geiger counter runs wild while approaching a child who survived the attack. In one scene, a woman holds her two infants her two infants as the monster approaches, telling them they would be soon joining their father, who probably died in the war. These scenes are naturalistic and brutal. 
Scenes of the radiation poisoning and the destruction of lives recreated the sense that the ghosts of the war were still haunted in Japan. And that in order to move forward, one must be at peace with the past. Apart from the uh, two atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, many major cities, including Tokyo, were targets to extensive bombing campaigns that caused enormous material damage and killing between 241,000 and 900,000 people. All of Japan had seen its fair share of destruction, and only nine years after the war, the scars were still fresh. This is why Honda's film made such a huge impact. The, medical, the metaphorical layer of Gojira sparked a debate on the potential dangers of scientific progress. In the film, a scientist, a scientist character devises a weapon of such destructive power that he becomes scared of its misuse. Even though he lets the device be used to take down the monster, he burns all of his notes and eventually commits suicide so that the weapon could never be used again. This act clearly illustrates Honda's opinions on the use of science and military purposes that were shared by many of his countrymen. His decision to create a monster so cruel, so unsympathetic towards anyone, including women and children and the old, indicated that Godzilla was more a god than a monster. In 2004, when a restored version of the film finally reached the U.S., the viewers were stunned. The film clearly wasn't just entertainment, but a testament to the suffering that the Japanese endured. Numerous other versions, remakes, knockoffs, and a sequel uh, sequels were made after the 1954 original, but none of them hold such an effective critique and significance as the Ishiro Honda original classic. So folks, that is how you put a message in your film. That is how you take something that is conceived as just basic entertainment and you make it deeper, you add layers to it. You see, a lot of people get all up in a huff when we critique Star Wars, when we critique Marvel movies, this and that, when they're trying to talk about the Betchel test or insignificant problems that don't exist. Because you look at something like Godzilla, Gojira, whatever you want to call the film, and you see how important and impactful the film was, but why it was created and the how, the life experiences, the things that people actually went through. We're talking 10 years post-World War II. The shit that people put in these movies today, like Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson never went through any kind of thing like this. None of us have. I mean, maybe your grandparents. I don't think we really reach such an old demographic in terms of uh, world-class bullshitters. But this was a story that was fresh in people's minds. It'd be like if they made um, an alien invasion movie that was reminiscent of 9-11 in 2011. I mean, we went the opposite way. We came out with Spider-Man and other stuff to take you out of it, but the Japanese were more introspective, and they gave us this movie. And stuff like this, stuff like They Live, allegory, medical uh, metaphors, all these things are really great when done right, when in the right hands of the right artists. X-Men, all of these things, X-Men had covered racism, homophobia, xenophobia, all these wonderful topics that are terrible but interesting for stories. They were covered incredibly well by a guy named Chris Claremont. The X-Men writers of, the t of today have faced no adversity, do not live in a world where adversity is a thing, so they create stupid stories about Iceman and other X-Men characters. They give Wolverine fire claws. They do all these things. Godzilla, Gojira, whatever you want to call it. I'm just going to call it Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Uh, it's an impactful film, and I've looked into this a long time ago.